Well, hello. Welcome to Holy Speak. And we are live today with Dr. Marion. I'm just waiting for Dr. Marion to get on um, Instagram. And then we'll be good to go. Can you hear me, Dr. Marion, yet? Yeah, I can. Okay, fabulous. So welcome, everyone. We are talking about cancer as a metabolic disease. And uh, joining me today is Dr. Marion, who is my associate here at Holistic Naturopathic Medical Center. And we love having her. So we're going to be talking about the difference between um, cancer as a metabolic disease. What does that mean? And the gene theory and what can we do to transform uh, the whole mechanism of cancer through incorporating the whole concept of cancer as a metabolic disease. So before I get started, I'm just going to wait for Dr. Marion to show up on uh, Instagram, and then we can go from there. Um, so there is more and more evidence showing that cancer is really primarily a metabolic disease versus um, a, a genetic disease. Um, so what that means is really that there, it involves disturbances in energy production through respira uh, respiration and fermentation. And I think Dr. Marion's just about to join me on Instagram. So it's an interesting concept that was developed by Dr. Seafried. Hello, Dr. Marion. So I was just talking about cancer as a metabolic disease and uh, how this is so interesting to look at cancer as a problem in respiration and fermentation of the energy production of cells versus just looking at it from a genetic perspective, which has been something that we've been basing all of our chemo and radiation therapies, all of our conventional therapies on for the past 60, 80, 100 years. So um, I'm so excited to talk to you about this whole thing because I think uh, there's so much to learn and so much to study and so much more that we need to research uh, in order to totally transform the way uh, we look at cancer, the way we treat cancer, and the way we prevent cancer. So Dr. Marion, um, what are your thoughts about this uh, cancer as a metabolic disease? Yeah, so um, I am just going to make sure there's not a lot of reverb. Are you hearing much reverb or anything? I'm not. Um, okay. It's pretty good to me. Okay, great. So um, I'm really excited about this topic. Um, cancer is, of course, a huge discussion. Um, and the one underlying common factor to all types of cancer is metabolic dysfunction. And so this was really brought about actually in the 1920s by um, a scientist by the name of Otto Warburg. He's actually a physician scientist, so MD, PhD. And it's known as the Warburg effect, but um, Dr. Warburg basically um, gave or put forth the idea that damage to a cell of mitochondria is what causes the cell to behave cancerously. And the mitochondria are the little factories of the cell. So um, they're in charge of producing energy. And they do so through aerobic respiration in healthy cells. Um, and basically a cancer cell does the exact opposite. It actually promotes or uh, produces energy by fermentation so without oxygen sorry aerobic is when oxygen is present and aerobic is without oxygen um and so that allows the mitochondria also are in charge of telling the cell when to reproduce and when to die and so we can think about when cancer is aberrant cellular replication and sort of forgetting um that when they should die that is a cancer cell and so that, that's because of the mitochondrial dysfunction and because of the anaerobic respiration that's going on and those cancerous cells consume about 200 times the amount of glucose that a normal cell would require. Uh, so that's quite a lot of glucose and you can imagine an environment um, such as diabetes or any sort of metabolically dysfunctional tissue uh, is going to have a lot of 
um, sugar, glucose around. And so that's going to promote a lot of dysfunction in those mitochondria or uh, in the cells in that area. Exactly. So, um, you know, the way I like to look at it is that the cells have about 19 <clears throat> times more insulin receptors than healthy cells. And so every time we are eating sugar, we're actually feeding Eat the cancer cells. And, um, and so this is really exciting because we can use oxygen and dietary modification to switch around the way cancer grows and feeds itself. Now, we also know that cancer, uh, one of the ways that it feeds itself is by creating blood vessels to itself, right? Mm -hmm. So um, looking at the inflammatory process of cancer is, is very important. In fact, what we have seen and what science is showing is that when there is chronic inflammation, that over time, over years, that chronic inflammation gradually causes a dysfunction in the cellular metabolism um, and then it leads to cancer production. So once the body, the cells kind of give up and say, ah, I can't keep up with this inflammatory response, then cancer is produced. So what we need to do, first of all, is to really look at the inflammation that uh, is going on in our body. Even if you're not diagnosed with cancer, we want to look at that. And then we also want to look at the way you're eating and the way you're feeding possible cancer cells. Because, you know, we all have these cancer cells. It's a matter of keeping it in control. And it's this balance of things getting... Um, dying off and then things that the cells that are growing so if we can kind of keep a balance between the healthy cells and the function of those cells and the replication of those healthy cells but at the same time killing off the bad cells that are more cancer producing because of the way they're metabolizing sugar um, then we're further ahead the other part of this which is really interesting is that uh, up to now we were looking at cancer with sugar as well as with um, oxygen, a lack of oxygen to that tissue being a source of food for the cancer cells. So if, you, if there is not enough oxygen, cancer will grow. If uh, there is too much sugar and insulin, cancer can grow. But cancer can also grow because of glutamine. And glutamine is a very common amino acid that, you know, we use for muscle building and weightlifting and a lot of athletes use. But in the process of the way the cancer works, and, it, you know, I'm really simplifying it, is that it actually creates more glutamate and it feeds off of that glutamate that it produces. So there is this uh, kind of a circular effect between feeding glutamate to it, and then also it producing glutamate. And that's one of the problems with radiation with, uh, for instance, brain tumors or uh, nerve-related uh, kind of tumors, is that when we give it radiation, radiation kind of um, breaks down those nerve cells and cancer cells, but then uh, as they're breaking down, it releases glutamate, and then glutamate comes around and becomes food for the cancer cells to grow. So initially, you may get um, a shrinkage uh, of the tumors because of the radiation killing it off. But long term, you're actually creating more food through glutamate production for the cancer cells to grow. So it's, it's a very fascinating uh, process. What else can you tell us about this uh, metabolic part of this cancer? Um, yeah, so um, I think, you know, one way to think about this is that um, we think we talk a lot about the terrain in naturopathic medicine. And the terrain is basically the body, it is um, your internal and external environment that and that creates the systems of which make up your your functioning human body. And so when we talk about cancer, that's a localized usually until metastatic process. Um, and in conventional medicine, they're looking at a lot at the dysfunctional genes, um, what's promoting those within, from a genetic perspective, what's promoting cancer. But we can talk about the terrain and um, we can think about the terrain like a garden. And so if you were to look at a garden and your plants weren't growing or the plants were dying, um, sort of a 
a lesser or a naive gardener might just spray weed killer and try to make something grow that way. But a really skilled and educated gardener might start to look at to make sure the soil has the minerals it needs, make sure the soil has the nutrients that it needs, that you're using healthy seeds, you're getting enough sunlight, there's not too much wind, there's not too much toxicity in the dirt. And so all of those factors that make up the sort of the terrain, the garden that's going to allow those plants to grow. And so when we're thinking about human bodies um, and we start to discuss cancer, we want to think about why that cancer came to be. And for me, there's always a reason that something happens. And I think that that's um, really where I diverge, at least from most conventional medicine models in that um, there is a lot of conditions where they just say, we don't know why this happened. And um, even when a gene contributes to the cancer, they don't know why that gene got turned on and so forth. Um, and just as an aside, genetic mutations only contribute to five to 10% of cancers. Um, and that makes 90 to 95% of cancers are a direct result from the standard, at least in the United States, from the standard American diet and toxicity and other issues. So that's a big chunk of cancers that are not related to the um, mutations, which is where 95% of cancer research goes to. So we really want to start to talk about the metabolism and what's going on with those cells, because that is, again, the common factor to all cancers. And so when we start to think about what causes the mitochondria, the little engines in the cells to fail, we can think about, well, any, any number of things, really, viruses. Um, we think about nicotine in the lungs, H. pylori in the stomach, radiation from things like Chernobyl, but also from cam cancer therapy itself. It's very common for people to get more than one cancer, especially if treated with uh, chemo and radiation. Um, genetic mutations, of course, are one of those things, and then traumas and chronic stress. And so all of those things contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction, and then that dysfunction leads to fermentation or anaerobic respiration, and later on, um, the chaos that becomes cancer. You know, it is, you mentioned the gene theory, and it is really amazing how much funds and energy has gone into the research around this gene theory. And like you said, it's only 5, 10, maybe at the most 15% of why there is cancer. And the rest of it is what we call epigenetics, right? Like you just mm -hmm. mentioned, it's all the every, everything else. And um, the interesting thing is that uh, when um, um, Dr. Warburg, who, who was, by the way, a Nobel Prize winner, for his discovery that uh, cancer feeds off of sugar and has this glucose metabolism and that when there is no oxygen to the area, the cancer grows, that that theory kind of got pushed to the side initially um, when, the can when the gene theory came about in 1940, in 1914 actually. And uh, it was all based on chromosomes and DNA and how that uh, those replications will get mutated and lead to cancer. And so this was forgotten until more recently in the last, uh, last 10 years when Dr. Seafried uh, from Boston, I think it's Boston College, um, discovered that basically there is a metabolism issue that's going on in cancer cells that we need to address. And we can do this through dietary modifications through lifestyle modification, as well as clearing that terrain that you so mentioned. Because when we do have a very acidic terrain, when we have our soil being too acidic, the plants don't grow as well. And that's the same in our body. The, the healthy cells don't grow, and instead the cancer cells thrive. So how do we get the body more alkaline and, um, you know, there is a lot of marketing out there with some of these alkaline waters and in regards to drink your alkaline water to alkalinize your system to reduce cancer. And, um, and that is really too simple um, uh, because it doesn't really discuss the fact that the stomach has to be acidic to digest food properly and the lower intestines, the small intestines have to be alkaline. And so it's not about getting every cell in your body into alkalinity in order to prevent cancer. It's actually bringing to balance each part of your body 
into their own functional balance in order for cells to uh, grow properly and to reduce uh, cancer risks. So when you're drinking alkaline water and your stomach becomes alkaline, you're actually promoting more fermentation in your small intestine and in your stomach and in your large intestine. And then over time, that can actually be a cause of more inflammation. And then we talk about how um, fermentation, a form of fermentation is really what cancer becomes. Do you have any suggest any uh, comments about um, the the alkaline water? Yeah, alkalinity doc. Yeah, absolutely. The um, you know the alkalinity or the the pH of our blood and of our tissues is pretty tightly controlled, and so your blood pH is and I might get this number wrong, but it really only varies between seven two point two and seven point four, and it's on a scale from zero to fourteen. The pH of the stomach is one. And so when you're pouring the so-called alkaline water, which is anywhere from a pH of seven or to nine or so into that environment that should have a pH of one in order to keep your stomach healthy and to keep bacteria out and to keep metabolism moving, um, then you are alkalinizing an environment that should be acidic. And then duodenum, which is just right next door, should be alkaline. And so that, again, is also very well controlled by the human body. Really, the only way that we can support shifting towards a more alkaline environment is through our diet um, and things like dark leafy greens, um, lemon water, which you would think is acidic and actually is acidic outside of the body. But the overall effect on the body when you drink it is actually to alkalinize the right environments and not necessarily the stomach. Um, but in a sense, you are essentially modulating the microbiome with certain foods that are going to help to alkalinize the gut, but you're not really going to be affecting the bloodstream to any significant extent. Exactly. And so foods like red meat, sugar, sugar is a big one, right? Alcohol is another big one. Fried foods, um, rancid oils. These are all foods, tomatoes that are cooked, uh, like really um, cooked uh, tomato sauce and more typical American diet, you know, the white flour, the white bread, all of that is very, very acidic to our system. So if we wanna create more alkalinity, we want to reduce those type of foods and increase, like Dr. Marin, you were saying, increase the vegetables and eggs and plant-based foods again. Um, and that will help reduce our risks for acid an acidic environment just throughout the whole system. Going back to the metabolic theory though, it's very um, exciting to know that some of the research is showing that the way to oxygenate cells and change the respiration of the cells itself and the, the mitochondria, the cell engine, is um, through certain ways of eating. And so it's not just the actual food that you're putting in, the, it's the timing of it. And what they're finding is that ketosis, so when your body goes into a fast for about 12 to 15, 16 hours, and your body goes into what's called ketosis, it's using ketones to burn fat versus sugar, that we actually begin to starve cancer cells. So part of the diet with um, shifting the metabolism of cancer is to actually do periodic fasting um, maybe overnight from like dinner, not to have anything and just drink water throughout until the next day, maybe um, at eight o'clock or 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock in the morning. So you just kind of extending the amount of time each time, teaching yourself how to go longer and longer without eating so that your body doesn't get too stressed. So you can't just go from a you know, regular six hour um, spacing between your meals to suddenly a 24 hour spacing or a 12 hour spacing of meals, unless we can't kind of teach the body that way. Otherwise you're increasing the stress and that can actually be more acidic in our system. So ketosis is uh, one of the ways that is used as a way of shifting the metabolism of the cells. Any other thoughts about how else to change the ketosis or change the metabolism of the cells through ketosis? Yeah, absolutely. So intermittent fasting is a really hot topic right now. 
Um, so I just wanted to touch on that. I typically recommend that my patients fast for a minimum of 14 hours every night, no matter what's going on with their health or their lives or their condition, everybody should be fasting a minimum of 14 hours. And then depending on certain conditions, um, it, whether it be for weight loss or for controlling something like cancer, I will have patients push that out to between 16 to 18 hours and sometimes even do a 24 hour or even a three to five day water fast. And so all of those methods are gonna be helping the body to get into ketosis, which means that the cells are going to be requiring uh, the use of fat as fuel versus glucose. And the glucose will essentially be low in the body. And so that's going to be um, basically not provide any fuel for cancer cells. And that will keep insulin low as well. Um, but another way of going about um, staying in ketosis is to eat a ketogenic diet. So eating a very low carb diet um, and typically that is anywhere between 10 and 50 grams of carbohydrates per day, depending on how strict someone's going. And you can actually measure your ketones with either a finger stick, and now they have breath meters that aren't quite as accurate, but a little bit less invasive. And then I'll help you to identify that yes, you are in ketosis. And depending on, again, what the health goals are, whether it's weight loss or for cancer, or for even um, controlling epilepsy, um, we might aim for patients to be between a ketone level of 0.5, to about 4.5 and above that it gets a little bit dangerous and below that you're not in ketosis but that is a method of kind of keeping yourself on track so um i just wanted to clarify for everybody out there that when you are fasting for 18 to 24 hours you really don't want to do it uh, every day because that means that you're only eating one meal a day and that can cause other issues so when it's intermittent you're intermittently doing it. in other words you may be doing it three days a week and then on those other days of the week, you're not doing that. And you're kind of tricking the body in that way. Um, the studies have shown that between 12 to 16 hours is, is sufficient for most um, intermittent fasting benefits. So I usually, you know, I kind of like it between that time, that period of time so that people don't get into the stress mode and the cortisol levels don't go up. So in addition to that, though, this whole theory about metabolism is the lack of oxygen utilization by cancer cells, right? So when there's hypoxia, which means lack of oxygen to tissues, to the cells, then cancer can grow. So one of the ways that we modify that as well is not only to go into ketosis, so you're going, you're doing either your intermittent fast or you're doing a high fat diet or even better, um, you're doing the combination but then you add in hyperbaric oxygen therapy or you add in some kind of an oxygen therapy, ozone therapy, something to oxygenate the system. And that way you are uh, really attacking both the, the chemical fuel for the cancer cells, but also the energetic fuel, which is the oxygen to the, to the cells. And some of the studies that they have been focusing on with metabolic um, um, shift with cancer cells is looking at the combination put together. When do you do the fast? When do you go into ketosis? And when do you go into hyperbaric oxygen tank or in an oxygenation mode to activate the healthy cells and starve the cancer cells? So it's also so very exciting research uh, that is being done. And I think that we're going to see some major shifts happening with uh, the rates of cancer as well as the way we treat cancer when uh, we start incorporating these in conjunction with some of the other therapies, conventional therapies that are going on. Now, please, again, do keep in mind that this, this video, this lives that we do are for informational purposes. So we're not making any claims and we're definitely not making claims that this is the way you're gonna cure cancer, but these are just, uh, thoughts and some of the current research that's going on that uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how beneficial these are in um, in future uh, research and, and cancer therapies. So we also mentioned a little bit about glutamine and uh, glutamate, amino acids that becomes glutamate. And glutamate is really the big fuel for cancer. And um, the research has really looked at the top 10 foods 
that block glutamine, uh, glutaminase, if I can say that right, which is the enzyme that converts glutamine to glutamate. So if we can block that enzyme by some of these foods, we are reducing the glutamate that would be available in the body and uh, it's... Um, fuel to the cancer cells is reduced. So some of these foods, or I should say maybe they're herbs more than anything else. One of my favorites is uh, sulforaphanes, doc, coming from broccoli seeds and broccoli sprout seeds and cauliflower and all of that good, good uh, cruciferous vegetables. Yes, we, we love our cruciferous vegetables, absolutely. Yes, yes. And then the other one that is very well known is curcumin. So would you like to share some information about curcumin? Yeah, curcumin is um, the active constituent in, in turmeric or one of the active constituents in turmeric and it's highly anti-inflammatory and has that bright yellow color that uh, probably we're all familiar with. It was actually used as a dye or is actually used as a dye, yellow dye. Um, and yeah, it's highly anti-inflammatory. I actually don't know much of its effects as far as blocking um, glutaminase, but um, we use it quite uh, extensively for all kinds of inflammatory conditions, including autoimmune diseases, GI conditions, um, and it's also really helpful in reducing pain because of the reduction in inflammation. So we'll often use it with cancer patients for that reason as well. Yeah, and curcumin has um, over 2,000 papers on it, and several hundred of them are focused on its effects as an anti-cancer, as an anti-inflammatory, um, some in brain tumors, others in breast cancers. Um, some um, report the fact that intravenous curcumin actually can shrink tumors um, quite dramatically. And so it is one of the substances that does block that glutaminase and the production uh, of glutamine or glutamate. And then green tea is another one, EGCG extract, which comes from green tea. That again has very similar effects uh, in terms of anti-inflammatory and um, anti-cancer properties, but it again, it blocks that enzyme. And so you get less glutamate, in other words, less food to, to the cancer cells. It is also both of those actually are one of the things that we use quite a bit. Uh, together as a photosensitizing agent in the laser therapies that we do. Um, so laser therapies, depending on the frequency of light, uh, we use that intravenously in order to optimize the immune system, activate the immune system, but also help the immune system fight off cancer cells. And one of the things that EGCG, uh, the green tea extract and curcumin do, is that they sensitize cancer cells to light. And so when you do give light intravenously to, uh, to the blood, then um, that light is, the benefits of that light are more uh, likely to be carried to the areas where the cells are sensitized to the light. And so when we give curcumin EGCG, it activates the benefits of um, the light therapy, the laser therapies uh, intravenously. It is a therapy known as photodynamic therapy. And again, it's something that came out of Europe, um, but there is more and more research being done on various types of cancers and photodynamic therapies. That's also very, very exciting research. So there's a few other uh, substances uh, that block the glutamase. Uh, one is valerian, ashwagandha, uh, soursop, which is a very, very popular therapy used in um, South America for cancer. Uh, Honeycule, which comes from the magnolia bark tree and resveratrol, which most of you have heard about from red grape seeds. And then lycopene, which comes from tomatoes, as well as uh, ursulic acid, which comes from holy basil and pistachio nuts. So some of these nutrients and um, substances found in foods can be very, very powerful in supporting your system or our system in reducing our cancer risks as well as helping us fight cancer if we're 
fighting cancer with um, any other conventional therapies, it's, it's a smart idea to include some of these things in your diet. But again, Dr. Marion, um, any final thoughts before we end? I know we've been talking for about half an hour now and it's coming, our time's coming up. Yeah, well, I would just say that, um, most cancers take months and sometimes years to develop into a detectable mass. And healthy adults produce around 500 to 1,000 new cancerous cells in one day. Um, and only one in 1,000 people is truly cancer free. So every day we are making cancer cells and the best medicine is prevention. And so looking at those factors that promote those 500 to 1,000 cancer cells to um, initiating more growth is really important. And so you wanna be looking at diet, making sure you're treating viruses that are going on in the body and um, cleaning up the terrain, making sure there's not toxicity, you're getting lots of sunlight and fresh air and not a lot of chronic stress and all those yeah. things. Yeah. But it's also important to realize that those things can be really helpful in conjunction with conventional therapies um, if someone is going through chemo or the more conventional treatments. So you really wanna combine the best of both worlds um, in order to give the person the best um, chance of living a great and full life. Exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Marion, for joining us. This is such a huge topic. And uh, we have kind of put this together for the month of October since it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And every week we are doing a, a part of the discussion on cancer and uh, holistic medicine and how to support your system. So next week on our live, we'll be talking about food as medicine um, in cancer therapies. And again, please remember that these are informational um, videos and lives and we don't intend to treat or make a claim on any cure as um, you have, if you do have cancer or family history of cancer, it is again vital for you to seek a more um, integrative or holistic physician to look at everything that's involved, like Dr. Marion was saying, the terrain, the viruses, the bacteria, the fungi, everything and your diet and lifestyle and try to guide you towards a system where it can contain um, these cancer cells and hopefully get your body to fight off the cancer cells while reducing your risks or uh, reducing any side effects from any conventional therapies you may be receiving. So please, um, if you do need any more information, contact us at holistichealth.com and we'll be happy to have a consultation with you. Have a wonderful week and we will see you next Thursday. Bye-bye.